thank you for everyone for your patience and for those of you who are with me since the uh, half an hour ago uh, discussing with Katie and then Tony about using Joanna's work particularly the truth mandala uh, uh, in workshops on deep adaptation and our experiences with that um, thank you for waiting for Joanna but uh, uh, and now and thank you to Tony thank you to for Katie for, for standing in uh, without any notice whatsoever Joanna hello and uh, hi, good, hi good how where you're in California are you is it afternoon there that's right that's right and then it turns out that there's several folks on this call that are here California California as well Colorado yeah here I so, see yeah, we have seventy-five people now. So um, I'm joining you from Greece, and I see people in the UK and, and so on. So this, everyone who's just for context, Joanna, everyone who's joining uh, joins as a member. Uh, they're, they're a member of the Deep Adaptation Forum, which I, I set up in order to to um, try and deal with the. In, in a useful way with the the amount of people who were getting in touch to after my deep adaptation paper came out and who wanted to really connect with others and explore uh questions of, of collapse and how do we feel and how do we what do we actually do in if we feel that some form of societal collapse is either inevitable or likely uh and of course that's how we connected um and i know joanna you and i have been having a couple of conversations over the last month but i'm really pleased that you agreed to do a Q&A uh, with us today. So welcome. Hi, good to be here. So I first discovered your work um, um, about 20 years ago, and I used a, I think I used your systems game in my teaching quite, quite, quite often. Um, but I really reconnected with it when particularly the work around how to, how to hold space for people dealing with with difficult emotions, uh, as, as, we're, as we as 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 we sense um, that we're in the heart of a, in the middle of a sixth mass mass extinction, and 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 we feel the the, the terrifying situation that that confronts us. How how do we how do we find some sort of both equanimity but also engagement so not to turn away but turn toward these difficult times and i felt your your book coming back to life really really speaks to that so first up i would i'd love any thoughts you could share on how you feel uh your work is 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 perhaps finding greater relevance and resonance around the world right now um, sadly, because yeah. of, of growing awareness of our predicament. Well, because this work sprang out of an awareness of this predicament, but that was 42 years ago. I had been an environmental activist with my family and my uh, teenage children. And we, uh, so that was, we knew a lot. And then it was my son, his freshman year in university, uh, when I visited in Boston, took me to a, a day, one day, looking at the threats to the biosphere. So this was 77. And there was everything. It was the Cousteau Society. Jacques-Yves Cousteau himself was there. But it was much more than the uh, destruction of the oceans and the pollution and the loss of plankton was a big concern then. But it was the oil spills. and the. But then it covered all the other things as well. Uh, the uh, depredation on the species, the extraction of the deforestation. So this was 42 years ago. And I went from uh, display to display uh, to panel discussions. And this was all information that I was familiar with. I was in my middle 40s then, or late, whatever. I just turned 90, so it's hard for me to figure back that far. But it's about halfway. Happy in birthday for recently. Nel mezzo del cammino de nostra vita, halfway in the course of our life. Any rate, um, but there was one thing I saw, and it just 
skipped it. And on my way back uh, to where I was staying on a train over the bridge of uh, the River Charles, I, it just suddenly hit me that our species was destroying our world. And that the, um, and the, what I saw, which somehow pulled out the uh, scaffolding that had kept all that information as information in my mind, my mental acuity there, it put, and it just cascaded down through my body, my heart, my feelings to my feet. And I thought, we're done. So this was, um, and I, and so the question for me from then was, how do I live uh, in a world that my species live, uh, how can I live uh, so that I am present enough, in full presence, so that I could enjoy it and be useful to good questions uh, while my species is destroying it. And, um, and that led to uh, the work that you have, that you encountered 20 years ago and a few months ago again. So that it became, uh, it was um, evident to me after a year and a half of sort of a dark journey that um, people did not lack information. And for me to tell people what was happening, particularly the people who were responsible or who were voting, but almost anybody, except a certain diehard activists, but almost anybody else, uh, they would turn away and say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. It is a shame, isn't it? Oh, such a shame, but there's nothing I can do about it. But they, there was a reluctance to feel mental pain, moral pain. So that was what started the work and that seemed central. How can we be with uh, discomfort, mental and moral and psychological discomfort? And, um, and I didn't like it myself, but I got very curious. <laughs> and so that went right from the start uh, we we were because I was teaching meditation at the time as well. Um, began to experiment with how close you could get to the fire, and mm. and then to um, we found simple things that we're still using, like open sentences, and much better than questions uh, that help people. And because I was looking for not to persuade people about how bad things were. That, that your eyes would just glaze over. That was the one thing they didn't want to hear. They just think, no, nah, no, nah, 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 no. So, but they, how could I get the voice from inside them as the most voice they most needed to hear, which was a voice of caring. And so that wasn't so hard. I see, I see. That yeah. really does come through in your work. The voice yeah. of caring inside them, to connect back with that rather than the, the fear of the pain that they might experience, that the fear of despair that would keep them away from con being conscious, uh, from, from connecting with their compassion and their benevolence. I just, yeah, Joanna, you... you mentioned meditation. Can I, can I uh, come in on that? You're welcome. So um, I'm, you, you're, um, you're a Buddhist, and I was wondering. I don't um, use that term. You don't use the term. How would no. you describe yourself? I'm a person who loves the teachings and practices of the Buddha. Right. But I the see. Buddha was not a Buddhist. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Take so off the labels. I was wondering how, um, how Buddhist philosophy and also Buddhist practices, uh, or either of them, uh, you, you think uh, or you're finding helpful uh, for, for yourself or for other people as, as we sense this um, ever greater uh, 
terror about uh, as as this destruction of life on earth seems to be coming to our own doorstep. Uh, when yeah. I say our, I'm I'm recognizing the people here on Zoom around the world, probably the educated middle class people, most people living in the West. It's sort of coming home to roost now, and that. So I was wondering if if you're finding Buddhist philosophy or, or, or Buddhist practices to be of, of of help in that context. I I did from the beginning. Okay. Mutually. Um, see the what 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 makes it difficult for us coming out of um, the Western mind, coming out of uh, the um, and theistic traditions, uh, is that um, we have uh, see ourselves as separate individuals. Um, basically, and um, and this has grown, of course, extremely strong in the last five centuries uh, of uh, hyper individualism. So, what for me, as a um, Westerner and a and an academic and a an activist and a professor, and uh, was to um, not just read about it. Uh, in books about them, but to uh, working with uh, Buddhist refugees from Tibet in, 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 in uh, the six, 60s, I encountered their way of being, and that intrigued me. And I, um, what I found was that the experience of being a uh, who you are is not put in an isolation cell or a prison cell of being a, a separate and permanent uh, self or individual. And that that is actually, that separateness and permanence is actually a delusion. And it's a delusion created by your appetites for uh, power and praise and, 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 the, and aversion. So to, so we've lost our way. Now it's okay if you think of yourself as, uh, um, well, well, let me get back to that. So that the, right now today, we, we, how do we handle such overwhelming, the, the world that I need, the world that has brought me forth or that I am now living on with my family and my job is coming apart. What'll I do? I'm lost. Uh, I went and, and I, how can I? So the move that the Buddhists made and now that you can make with an understanding that our world is alive, that our earth is a living system, that everything we are and know and feel and uh, is part of that earth, if you make a shift, break free of that isolation cell uh, of the separate self, always so greedy for um, recognition and uh, mm. and, all, and, and so ready to compete. This, this uh, yeah. needing to be right, this separate <clears throat> falls prey to I got I gotta find somebody who can I blame for this could I could I just pick up on that one which is which is fascinating to me because you've you've talked about your work about inviting people into that place of compassion and you've just said also to one of the ways of not one of the ways of coping with a sense of that you're losing control in your life and things are falling away is 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 to blame somebody just on that issue. So I find that quite a lot of people who are either concerned about climate change or, or who are clearly activists on climate change are talking about who to blame. Uh, and it may be oil executives or it may be a whole country that's profligate or a whole class of people. And I was wondering 
what are your thoughts on the, I mean, and, and also some people say that it's actually strategic or tactical to, to have someone or to blame. I was wondering what your thoughts are on blame in general, but also what, 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 where that might come from in terms of your, your spiritual philosophy and so on. And I, I'm thinking also, let, let's make this, um, why should the, uh, what are your thoughts on whether or not young people should be blaming us? for the predicament we've created. So children today who are facing such a terrifying future. Well, I'm not hearing blame from okay. them. Uh, from Greta Thunberg on, by and large, I only hear them wanting us to hear them. They want our ear. Listen to me, they say. Don't turn away, listen care please care about this you've got the levers of power as she says to whether she's in davos or talking to the uh, house of whatever parliaments where she can get out without taking a plane um, that there, so i don't see, frankly i don't i don't get blame from the young ones and the the youth and the millennials um because they uh, know that they're, well, I don't know, I can't explain why, but they don't. And I think that the people who are the most um, uh, susceptible to blaming are the ones who have the smallest and tiniest sense of self, that they are totally identified with their social or economic position and uh, their uh, the votes or voices or, that they can uh, harvest. So that the, um, we are called, I've just sp spent a day with a, a, a wisdom keeper of the a rainforest in, in the Amazon and I have never met a more humble person and it evokes the humility Humility is freedom, as far as I'm experiencing again to go, because you find this in the indigenous people. You don't have to go to the Buddhas. As a matter of fact, I know some Buddhas who are pretty concerned about their rank mm. minority. So. Thank you. I was wondering the other aspect of blame is self-blame or guilt. And how, if you hear people who feel guilty about this situation and our contribution to it, what, what's your... What's your, uh, what's your response? Yeah, I could say that we're, uh, you know, there again is a focus on the separate self. It could be endless. You can look in the mirror morally from now to doomsday. That is so boring. We've got to graduate from that. We have a planet-wide disaster will we finally step out of your separate um, self-adulation because self-judgment and self-praise are so equal. You're focused on how great you are. We could just take it off as if we're taking off a suit of armor. Excuse me. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, as I feel that way too. And I, uh, and I don't know how to uh, often to say it. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, um, yeah, it's just to, because I've, I've had a lot of people, um, to talk to me about our predicament and all these sorts of things about who to blame or blaming the self and so on. And none of those views seem to lead to, uh, compassionate action. So yes, I, I hear what you're saying very clearly there. Yeah. Um, I'm going to turn it open now, Joanna, to the 80 people who've joined us and invite. Uh, so uh, hopefully, Joanna, would you be able to stay with us uh, for another half an hour? Is that possible? Yes. Okay, yes. good. So we'll have half an hour of questions. And of course, people who thought this was ending uh, on the hour then obviously duck out. Uh, and I'm sorry for the, the delay in getting started. Um, Matthew, um, I know you were going to... I, what I think I'd like to do is actually have a question on, on hope. And the context for this, Joanna, is um, I have been criticized for um, sort of taking away hope by talking about how I 
believe now that, that a societal collapse is inevitable. Uh, and so I know you've done quite a bit of work on hope in the past. Now we have a question on hope from Iwan. Um, and Matthew, Matthew, if you could unmute uh, Iwan and um, we'll, we'll hear from Iwan directly on this matter of, of hope. Have you? Uh, right, well, I see their face. Hi there. Hey, can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, lovely to talk to you, Joanna. Um, I was a student of Jiddu Krishnamurti, and he used to say that hope must die. Uh, and I wonder how you relate to that. Well, he's got a point. He's, yeah, I, I, I myself, when I wrote the last, I uh, co-wrote the last book called Active Hope, my people who've been with me over the decades couldn't believe I had written anything with the word hope in it because I had been experiencing and saying and teaching all along that if your attachment to hope takes you out of the present moment and this is where you can act. You can't act yesterday. You can't act tomorrow or next year. You can act now. Now is this huge, beautiful arena of the present moment. And this is where you can make a difference. And so hope actually takes you out of the present into what you conjecture is uh, going So that's why. However, uh, with my uh, co-author, uh, Chris Johnston, who's living up in northern Scotland now, and we... Uh, actually wrote the book by Skype, which is quite a romp. And um, what we did was combine it with both systems theory and um, um, the Buddhist teachings, where uh, what you can do in the moment is you, with your intention to know what you want, what you wish for what you uh, love, oh, the, the program, uh, civilizational program that uh, you want to get, get behind, even if you feel it's unlikely. But that's where if you want to get behind. And so we linked hope with intention, which is what actually both in both systems and and Buddhism happens. And that way we could talk about that's that's active hope. Active hope is what you can do right what you, you see yourself and choosing to do. It's that great thing we have, which is choice. There are people choosing to um, be online right at the moment. And those who have a last to choose that they have to go because their babysitter's gone. Thank you. Any thoughts on that, Iowa? Well, yes. Um, um, lots. <laughs> I mean, it, it feels to me that, you know, there has been a, a turn of events, that the feeling that it is too late and, and this draining away of hope, um, especially, you know, relating to what I do as well, uh, using theatre uh, to produce re-enchantment. Actually, this is my work. Um, because I don't think anything's going to change unless there's a re-enchantment and a love of nature. Um, okay. I, yeah. I mean, just say, um, I, I, the other day I was uh, talking with somebody about this and I brought up the example or illustration uh, from the Fellowship of the Rings and Frodo going to through Mordor for the ring and s imagining somebody asking him when he's in the hardship working, uh, do you have hope? Are you optimistic about this venture? <laughs> and I, I, he doesn't have time. Get out of here. I don't have time for questions like that. You have to concentrate. So it's not that hope you're hopeless. You just don't, don't bother talking about hope or nurturing hope if you're looking right at the moment, right at the act you're in the middle of. That's very clear indeed. Oh, that's, um, that's my one o'clock clock. Oh, 
you have a fun clock, but more fun than mine. So, yeah, I've 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 um I've started to hear people talking about being hope free, uh, but other people then talking about a kind of hope which is how we wish to be in the moment, rather than speculating on things we we won't we don't really know about. But that also connects though to this this idea of uh, some strands in spirituality. Uh, particularly influenced by the law of attraction concept, think that uh, we need to imagine some positive material future for it to be so. And by not imagining that, we somehow make it so. I was wondering what you, uh, what you say to people like that. I'm thinking also of, um, the, yeah, the, we, we hear a lot about the power of vision, the power of a compelling story around the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible, for example. Well, what are your thoughts on those people that say that we, we need a powerful vision of a better material future? Well, I think it's a very unfortunate example of magical thinking. That, you, that, that uh, your thinking of something makes it so. And I haven't myself found that persuasive or useful in my life. Mm. So I think that being willing to be with what is I had a, uh, to, I was having a hard time at last fall over uh, at, at, I was actually went to a facility. Oh, I'm talking too much. Let's bring on the. The I'm next question. That. Okay, sure. We're going to uh, ask, there's a question from, from Linda. And by the way, please do put questions. If you're ready to ask questions of Joanna, put them in the chat box. Also, um, uh, it'd be good to get a mix of, of, of men and women uh, asking asking questions. Linda, you've asking you're asking a question about if uh, it's to do with being a a speaker and a teacher and a, on this topic and and how difficult it is to find something to say in these desperate times. Uh, over to Linda, Matthew, if you could un unmute Linda. I, I, think, I think I am unmuted, but thank you. Uh, yes, I. I, um, hi, Joanna. Thank you so much for today. Hi. I, um, I podcast and uh, ironically is the reluctant evolutionary at Voice of Evolution Radio. And I, I wrote a radio drama series about why the world is where it is as an imaginary character giving a kind of not advice, but sharing an open-handed offering to humanity about where we are and how we got here today. And after I wrote that, I found that I, I didn't know what else to say, that I, I haven't really podcast in a very long time. And I'm, you know, how do we be with all we know and find compassion for our own reluctance? Because I have to raise my hand as a reluctant evolutionary myself and and how do we use our voices in combination uh, an urgency and humanity i i'll add to it that i'm also I, I became certified as a forest therapy guide so that i could reconnect people to the more than human world and make it personal again because i know that if something is personal we care about it and we want to protect it and we have categorized it as an object so that we see it as outside of ourselves right now. I, you know, I have so much trouble today finding my own voice in this, being a voice for the voiceless and I can't find my own voice. And so I'm wondering if you might have some thoughts about that. Well, I think this is a very, can be a very fruitful situation. I think that that's then, give yourself a break from your own voice. There are so many people who are shooting off their opinions. How do you know what's your own voice? Um, but you can let other parts of you speak. You can let uh, your um, taste buds speak or your feelings of your heart speak. Oh, this is good. Oh, this scares me. Um, the I think it's a sign. I was just, we were just talking about this, this man from the rainforest, this teacher. He was so humble. He was so humble. And that the, if, but you can, you can write stories or you can ask questions. You, you can turn from not having your voice 
to having a uh, being of this blessed state of curiosity and inviting people to speak how they see the world. What scares them? What worries them? What do they love? Our first question uh, at, at, in a climate emergency um, meeting uh, a week or two ago, I did an open sentence, which was, as I face, as I face collapse of our culture, what I'm grateful for is, that's a wonderful question, try it. That's a brilliant, brilliant, that's really powerful for me to hear that as well, Joanna. <laughs> um, in the sense of, of, and it's a difficult thing to do, isn't it, when suddenly people, everybody wants someone with the answers, everyone wants someone to give them a pep talk, and... And you know what, excuse me, they don't want it, they don't want your answer. Basically, mm. they ask as if they want, but what they, in their deepest heart, they want to hear the voice inside them. Yes, very beautifully put. I, I had a, an experience recently at a, at a camp um, where after a Q&A, which was set up where I, therefore I was an expert on this topic of, of societal collapse and, and how we live with that anticipation, um, there were quite there were parents of of young children, and they were particularly troubled by this. Uh, and I have no answers, and no answers at all about about. But so the only answer was simply to offer a space. And 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 Katie and another camp member, they just hosted the space, and it was an invitation for people to share their emotions uh, with no answers. It's just to be with the pain and to witness each other's pain, and honor that it's like say it 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 is the way to be in this predicament there's no way out of it we, just, we have to be there with that pain and and then and then find community find something else on the back of that sharing you so are a brave man and that is exactly uh what i find so admirable and so persuasive that true humility of yours uh is what what caused me to believe right off the bat, here is someone that I want to read and learn from. Mm -hmm. You are entirely there. You're not trying to sell anything. You're not even trying to sell um, your own brilliance or you're not trying to sell humility. You're not trying, you're just putting it, you're joining people. You're paying them the great compliment, the great honor of being uh, intellectually naked are emotionally available before and I think that this allows excuse me for preaching I tend to preach but this this allows Gaia Gaia consciousness to speak through you or any of us who get our separate competitive self out of the way thank you thank you Joanna and You've spoken to my higher self. I know I fall away from that. I get busy. I fall back into ego stories of, of doing and responsibility and contribution. And, and, uh, and then I become imbalanced in my personal life. And all the, all the, all the nonsense that goes on goes on in me too. <laughs> but that was wonderful to hear. Thank you very much. And bless you. Um, uh, I've seen quite a few questions are now coming into the chat box. Wow. Um, um, I'm going to go to Becca. Becca, who's got a question here. Uh, Matthew, if you could unmute Becca. Hey, Joanna. Um, thank you once again. And I would love to hear if you have any advice on what is the best way to come to terms on the spiritual level with ours on the planet's demise. Um, I'm just curious to know what your reflections have been on. Do you think this is a part of our collective soul's evolution? Is this supposed to be how things unfold? Because it's so hard to accept the loss and suffering, but is this maybe just some form loss of form we are facing? Um, you know, I, I, I guess what I'm coming up against a lot at the moment is really dealing with people's existential crisis and grief around what's happening. And I'm trying to understand the best way to support them through their own coming to terms with what is.
we've been given this beautiful life, this beautiful planet. If you let yourself really love it, if you let yourself be open to what the ancient ones and the indigenous people and the um, contemporary science, this is a living planet. Uh, you can find that you can grow in your life in widening circles, widening circles that reach out across the world. You're, you're that big. We're liberated from a, that little prison cell of the ego. And then when you're in widening circles, you see pain. Oh, yes, you do. But you see also uh, a, a the beauty of this planet out of which we grow, then we're not, we aren't coming out. I don't believe we're coming from anywhere else. We weren't manufactured. We're not coming out of a laboratory, but even that would be coming out of, so that this, we can um, plumb and just turn to, uh, again, our gratitude for life and for the love of this. And when we see, oh my God, things are going to be bad, then you say, well, how can, how can we, uh, so you see what's falling apart is a demented system. It is a system, a political economic system of the industrial growth society corporate capitalism and its guises in non, you know, uh, countries that don't like to use the word capitalism, but they are commodifying our mother. They're breaking her up and eating, devouring that. So this needs to be, this needs to de be destroyed. This needs to come apart, not be destroyed, but it's, and so we look at this, how can we love this world as this de demented and destructive political economy dies. We go into a system, what we call in systems thinking, positive disintegration. This happens actually at every stage of the evolutionary as we evolve from one level of evolution to another. The old codes, the old appetites, the old fears have to come apart. The armor has to be taken off so that the soft, sensitive skin and fingertips, so that the vulnerable parts, eyes and lips and ears can grow so that we can grow in connection. It's only to connect. We grow and learn in connection. And the industrial growth society forgot about that because you can't build connection in a factory. Can I, can I just come in on that, Joanna? Yeah. The, you're you're uh, pointing to, well, some people tell me that actually, why do I sound so gloomy or terrified about collapse? If it's the collapse of industrial consumer growth society, uh, which has been so abusive, not only to nature, but to our nature and to us as nature, then, then why, why be so doom and gloom about, about it? And I think, well, mm, because it's, <laughs> it's going to be quite a lot of pain along the way and, and maybe people dying young and, and so on. So yeah, what's, what's your response to the people who say, oh, let's just welcome collapse. It's, it's, it's about time. Well, um, I can see their point, but we, we have, we can't just say, toss it all so that we, we can try to make what I was hearing already uh, in the 90s, as more and more people were recognizing the mortality or the short liveness of this um, corporate capitalism, we need to bring it to a, a soft landing. Let's, let's not, well, and that was even back then, contemplated that we could but now but that's still so we 
we try to acquaint people so that with the necessity of this maybe so that they don't uh, blame each other it's the blaming the system otherwise they turn that this is this is all because of trump or all because of um the um mexicans trying to get into the states or you know we blame each other that's pointless we've all made a huge mistake yeah so there's <laughs> that sense of unfortunately uh we humans could make a bad situation worse um, rather than learn from it and have this as a as a rather tough invitation to awakening uh, and for me i think I, I don't see i don't have any story i don't believe in any story that this means that all of humanity will awaken to peace and love and understanding but many of us will and we can be actively seeking to do that ourselves and be part of that ourselves um, I think that's what what you were you were saying as well I'd like to um, call on Azul who's with uh, with Tony in Totnes uh, Azul you have a question and I think it's um oh let me see Azul's face okay so Azul can you un uh, 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 Matthew can you look for Tony Look for Tony and unmute Hello. Tony and Azul is there. Bonsoir, Joanna. <laughs> it's fine. You're on. Hi. Yes, hello, we can hear you. Yes, hi. Hi, Joanna. Hi, everyone. Hi, uh, Joanna, I have a question which is, um, actually, I might have changed the question. Originally, my question was, if you were speaking from the river, what would you say to us? Uh, but I remember that you have a tree outside the window that you love very much. So perhaps, uh, yeah, perhaps you could, uh, we could change the river to the tree, whatever you choose. Thank uh, you. No, I was thinking, uh, I was just thinking that, the, 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 you know, that, that last sonnet of Rilke's that I love so much. And he says, uh, and if the world has ceased to hear you, say to the rushing, no, say to the silent earth, I flow, and to the rushing water speak, I am. So we give, we, experience our interexistence. I had a wonderful revelation at the dark river near you, where a wonderful swan spoke to me. <laughs> the year was the year after the year my husband died. We have the the earth is alive, as you know. We can awaken to that. And the, the way, uh, awaken that the, the earth uh, holds us. The poets know that. The early, our ancestors knew that. The early ones know that. And to be with our mother as she's suffering, do we not want, could anything be sweeter than to be with her in this hard time? Do you look at your watch, say, I can't bear to, I, I don't have time to be with the suffering of my mother? Mm -hmm. We discover our love all over again. Music's wonderful, rushing rivers are wonderful, poetry's wonderful. Looking Thank at two poets right there. Thank you, Joanna. Um, I am uh, I'm loving the reaction on faces um, around the world through this digital system. I'm seeing faces uh, with tears of joy. Uh, so I, I wonder, I don't know quite how to ask this question. Um, 
uh, you just you just turned 90 and uh, I was wondering as as death becomes less of an abstract thing in your own life in terms of your own mortality as it becomes something that m might be more imminent I mean who knows I might die tomorrow but it, it, it there's a sense that it may be more imminent now how is that if anything changing your outlook if at all uh, in is in and it does that can we learn anything from that in terms of as as we as we fear our own mortality as we look at what's happening with with climate change and the the potential for uh, a, a breakdown in our own way of life i don't fear it i want to stay around as long as i uh can keep up with what's happening. Um, I think this is the most exquisite moment on earth. I think the conversation we're having now is the conversation we all need to have. We all need to fall in love again with what is. And what is is an exquisite planet with wonderful arts and great species and we have a chance to move together and not blow ourselves up and not kill ourselves with these misplaced fears i am um, would like to i just received a painting i can't do that that i look at and it's a painting from a friend I've never seen because he's on death row at this San Quentin prison. And uh, he painted um, a, a woods, like a woods you go through, or like Dante found himself in the woods in the middle of his life. And then in the woods, he has in the distance, uh, his name is Orlando, and he painted a window. And the window, uh, is op that open and there's a white bird flying through like and I saw it as an angel of death first but and you look through the window and there are fields and oceans and waters beyond uh, and I saw oh that's my death he's painting my death so uh, I just find it you know Jim, I think at Buddha fields around the universe, people are lining up to be born on earth right now, to be here now, because this is a moment of such exquisite realization. And that's why I love you so much, because you are helping people realize actually what it's like to be, show what a human, a human can be at this time. So I look at that picture from San Quentin, that man that I said, oh, that's my death, but I'm going to stay here in the shrub shrubbery for a while longer, as long Excellent. as I can. Thank, you for, thank you for, for answering that. And wow, I, I, uh, I, I, I just can only hope that I, I I'm, I'm, for me, I'm new to this path, Joanna. I'm, I had sort of a, a positive disintegration of self um, about a year ago and, and decided to not do that quietly <laughs> uh, and still experiencing the consequences of that. But um, it's been wonderful to, to connect with what is most important in life. And you've spoken to that very clearly over the past hour and so much so just in, in reflecting on that last question. So thank you very, very much. And, um, and I'm going to call it to a close now because we've, we've overrun. So um, uh, thank you everyone around the world for tuning in and also for dealing with the technical issues with your patience. Thank you, Joanna. Wonderful to, to connect to, not just your words, but that sense of passion and divine inspiration behind the words. It's wonderful indeed. So I really feel blessed to have been chatting with you today. Thank you, Thank Jeff. Thank you for this hour.